Women met us in the middle of summer 2024, in the last days of July in Italy, where I live quite hot. I don't know how it is in South Africa. I think there will be cold. <laughs> but in San Diego, there might be also warmth. So we are international, as you can see. And we start, as always, with the check-in. Shall we first go to, to the winter in South Africa? <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Anneli. I'm in Cape Town. And yes, it's very, very wet, very, very cold, like we've never had before. Okay. And um, although I've been acclimatizing since last year's coming year, it, this year is just completely different, completely different. Mm -hmm. It's uh, We have had many, many storms, flooding, lots of snow, um, mm -hmm. very disruptive rain. I love rain, but it was really disruptive, but um, we're surviving, we're surviving. And mm. in my own life, also many things are happening, so I'm glad that I'm here with you ladies, and that I can spend this time together with you. And I'm passing to Christine. Um, hello, Christine from Carlsbad, California. Um, the weather here is nice. Uh Summer goes very quickly. At the beginning, I always have this these aspirations for what I will be doing and uh, have done some of it. It's been fun, um, having some fun, try to use these months to be a little bit more spontaneous and get out of the house more. Um, have some vid visitors coming in a few weeks, my friend from high school. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Work is work, same stuff. Uh, that's going fine, and Tom's health is good. So uh, yeah, we're we're pretty content and uh, enjoying ourselves. And I will pass to Lorraine. Thank you. Um, yes, I guess I I last saw you as Heidi reminded me about six months ago. Um, I am on a path toward retirement, but I still have a few patients that I'm seeing and I have just switched to once a week and I'm seeing them on Wednesday. So I'm free on Mondays now. Um, I was just on the East Coast and the weather was disgusting. It was so hot. I experienced heat exhaustion twice. And I thought I was having a stroke. It was really, really bad. And I grew up back there. So I should I should be used to it. But it's gotten, I, I don't know, maybe I, I'm not adapted anymore. But um, anyway, um, yeah. And I guess probably my main focus right now is to figure out what retirement is going to be like. There's some fear about it. You know, I've gotten a lot of satisfaction and meaning from my work, and I don't know what's going to happen when I let it go completely, which should be shortly. On the other hand, I feel like I'd like some sort of adventure, another adventure, and, um, you know, have enjoyed traveling, but uh, we'll see what happens. I'm I'm trying to sell my house and downsize, and that is also fraught with a lot of back and forth, changing my mind about various things. So that's a little disconcerting, but probably my summer project. So, and I will pass it to Monia. Uh, let me just ask you two questions. Where do you mm -hmm. live? Oh, I live in San Diego. I'm sorry. I, I live right uh, right near Christine. And what was your work? Psychologist. Psychologist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, well, I'm Monia in Vienna, and we are having rather hot spells as well. Not, not, not as bad as in Italy, but uh, today it was... 28 Celsius and dry, so it was rather nice. But last week I really was just, uh, and now at 82, I feel the heat much more than I did before. 
So I'm very careful before I leave the house. I take Kratekut, uh, which is just to get your circulation going. And I slow down a lot. And yeah, I have my recliner and there I rest in between. Uh, my husband's health, yeah. Well, there will be no improvement, but he just keeps on. He's, uh, he's not very uh, stable in walking, but that's the way it is. And we try to make the best of it. And we are staying on our balcony, which is rather large. And we play cards just to keep the brain cells moving and our grandchildren live nearby so and their dog so they come and visit us which is always very pleasant um, my husband has been retired now for oh, uh, I think yeah almost a decade more than a decade two decades two and a half, one and a half decades and we found that it's good to retire when you're still in your health and can move around and travel, which we did at that time. But now we don't travel anymore and I don't really miss it. I hate airports and it's just, I'm glad I don't have to go to an airport and I'm always very upset being in time for a train, so that's one of my uh, nightmares. Missing a train is back from my childhood, so when there was nothing but a train and you had no handy. So anyway, um, we are quite satisfied. It's quite satisfactory the way we live, and next week will still be hot but in the in our apartment we have a uh, ventilation a ventilation and it's, it's okay but we don't have a, a, a what is it klimaanlage um condition hmm? air conditioning air conditioning no we don't have air conditioning because yeah in in austria it's still rare but my daughter has one so it's if it's if i really need cool i go to my daughter who lives next block okay heidi i pass on to you thank you yeah air condition when it's really hot and we have about 40 centigrades you know a little bit more so uh, the authorities say go to the big supermarkets when in the hot hours <laughs> <laughs> two, we say two flies with one uh, uh, beat, you know, first you, you are uh, in, the, in the cool area and then you can buy <laughs> and spend money. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, I heard as a topic, retirement and living life in the third half of our lives um, and give it sense a sense of a meaning, a meaning for why we go on. I don't know if this is uh, what you would like to discuss. Okay, so if you say yes, then I invite you, Lorraine, uh, to, to utter what is your preoccupations or your ideas or visions or fears or whatever and then we will chime in mm -hmm. okay uh well as i mentioned before as a psychologist you know i've been able to work virtually so um I i've been able to work continuously even though i've let go of my office and all of that and that's been good um and I like the idea. I mean, I feel fortunate that I can kind of ease into retirement in this way um, and do it in a manageable way. But the day will come when I have to let go. And I think one of the, talk about psychological issues, but one of the things I'm dealing with sort of emotionally is 
I've pretty much been a caretaker since I was three years old. Um, you know, the oldest of four children, the oldest of 30 cousins in a big extended family. And my parents were immigrants to the United States. They're actually from Malta. And, um, you know, um, I've been, I was married for about 30 years of my life, but I am currently divorced. And, um, and I just, I sort of want a space in my life where I'm not taking care of anybody. I don't have pets. I don't have plants. I don't want to take care of them. <laughs> Sounds like selfish, but for a woman being selfish is kind of an extraordinary thing. <laughs> So I, I'd like to experience that. Um, I have a niece who has a, a long-term issue with cancer. Um, she was diagnosed at 19. She's now 34, but she's regarded in general as terminal. But today they can manage cancer in a way that they couldn't manage it before. So I want to be available. To my family for that and I, I I visit with them frequently uh there's did you want to greet the new person before I went on or Go ahead, just yeah. yeah so um I've been trying to sell my house not I haven't tried to sell it yet I'm that's another emotional tug um that I, I want to sort of uh, just get a smaller space that's less to take care of. At the same time, it's hard to let go because I created this house that I really, I really like it. So that's another kind of tension. Part of me wants to sell everything and just rent for a bit and then I can travel more. I have relatives in Malta that I visit fairly frequently. Uh, every few years, and I, I'd love to spend more time in Europe, but uh, you know, I'm I kind of got all this right now to manage. So, but tell us about what your concern is more specifically about if you were not to see those few people, what do you think the void would be? What would be the emptiness that you're wondering about? Mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah. Gertrude and say that we are talking about uh, retirement and visions and keeping a meaning in, in life. And Lorraine, I don't know if you have met her. She was here already a few times in last year, let's say. And mm -hmm. so uh, I asked her to, as she brought up the topic, to, to talk about her visions, her fears and whatever. Okay. So if I, re one of those fears, just to address your question, Christine, if I stop seeing patients altogether and I stop this caretaking, um, will I feel like there's meaning in my life? <laughs> and I suspect that I, I just want a period of time where I'm not um, sort of responsible for anyone else's life when I can what I envision is that I can, I'll be able to hear my own voice more because me defining what I need and want is kind of hard. I'm not sure if it has to do with difficulty making decisions or just difficulty focusing on what it is that I specifically want and need. So that's a little bit murky right now. And it's a little bit scary to let go completely because as somebody mentioned, you know, where will the meaning in my life come from? So um, with other big decisions in my life, I, I was never absolutely sure of a decision. I would just be mostly sure. And in one of those moments when I feel excited about the change, I would take the plunge and do it. Um, and usually those those risks worked out. I don't know if it will now. I'm older. I'm not as resilient. I don't want to lose connections that help nourish me. So, you know, those are the fears 
of letting go of my practice, that it will be very lonely and I will flounder and I will not establish kind of a new meaning in my life, mm-hmm. or I will not have the energy to pursue some new, something new and meaningful in my life. And those are all the fears. Yeah, I can relate to that because I have a similar situation. I have a big house and I have created all that in 30 more years and let it go. Ooh, mm, how can we do? But with this question, let's ask our oldest member. <laughs> Maybe she has some ideas. Yeah. yeah. You said, Monia, that you uh, are over 80, so... You might be the oldest of us. <laughs> yeah, but I still would like to have Gertrude check in before yes. we continue into more depth. Thank you for reminding. Yeah, thank you. And sorry for being late. I had a short coaching just in that group. Um, I'm Gertrude from Germany, north of Frankfurt. And um, not everybody knows that I became fifth time time grandmother on May 31st. (laughs) Yeah, and and I had the very big joy of being there a week before and then two weeks after. So I, I brought the the two year old to bed the night they went to the hospital and um, that was a big privilege for me (laughs) that I was allowed to do that and yeah so it's so it was very much um, that that yeah took a lot of thinking time and and uh, awareness to be there for them and what i realized is how much i really love how my girls turned out and what loving and capable moms they are and also in their in their work so so I'm I'm a little bit like there is this joy of being just grandma <laughs> and and also yeah how long am I going to work what am I going to do is it so I'm a officially I'm 68 now so I'm officially a pensioner with not much pension so I have to work for some time still but um, yeah, so the meaning question is around here. Though the grand being grandmother has quite a bit of meaning. Yeah, they are all just every age is just adorable and incredible. And I didn't tell you that this one who just had her second baby, they are going to get married end of August. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, One more thing, I just come. I had the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in two meetings. <laughs> so first I did that uh, instant change meeting, what I, the, the new thing I learned. And in the afternoon, I did a WeFlow um, training in, um, it was US time. So I did nine hours, the first one, <laughs> and then and then another four hours afterwards. And it was really just fine it was uh, and it energized and happy and and uh thank you Haneli, for your i wanted to get back to you but i couldn't the weekend was 13 hours of work so <laughs> yeah i'm pretty energized by that work i'm doing so now monia <laughs> uh your question again heidi <laughs> Uh, 
my question was, you heard Lorraine, what she said, and she was preoccupied because she stays in a certain age at this point, and you are a little further. And so I was wondering what, what you would say about that. Uh, I was just adding and calculating in the meantime, and my husband has been retired. He retired at 60, which is rather early, but he is a state we worked in the diplomatic service and we just felt it would be fine just to be for ourselves. And the minute our first grandchild was born that year and he was also occupied with him, the first grandson and uh, yeah, so we, we Actually, we have, we have three grandchildren and we have been very much involved with all of them because we were considered rather young at that time when they were born. Um, and it was, it's rather sort of funny, the minute he stayed at home, I started to work. Uh, I, oh, mostly by the, the Integral Institute. So on the computer, I translated for them the texts of Ken Wilbur, and then I got more and more involved, and then we founded a salon in Vienna. So I really started getting out uh, of the house and being involved with many other people. So being that close, at home, as we are now, you need really to be a little older than 60. Mm -hmm. At 60, it's just, yeah, I had to get my energy, another channel, another venting. Um, but my husband was always very involved in church activities. So uh, this is what he continued to do in our local church, Catholic at that time, because now he no longer attends. Uh, he only watches on, on television, the, the mass, because it's hard for him to leave the house. And we had balls, we organized balls, uh, ballroom dancing for the church, uh, and there were, of course, uh, many other activities. And that kept him busy for, I should say, another 10 years. And then he had a fallout with one of the priests who just, yeah, was very, uh, <laughs> he didn't want his sacred oils to be bought by somebody else. So it's, it's, it's just stupid that the, the, the right two people came uh, together and they couldn't stand each other. And as I said, we are still rather close with our children, as with our daughter who lives one block away, and we tended to the grandchildren. And Lorraine, I'm really puzzled. I understand that you need time for yourself, but the joy of taking care of someone else is one of your main joys in life. As if I understand, because what you can do for others, it makes you happy, isn't that? And of course, taking the responsibility for others' lives, I understand that you just had enough of that and want to look at yourself, uh, your needs. And uh, we, when we retired, when my husband retired, we moved into a smaller apartment because I didn't want to take care of so much space anymore. And now our children live there. So we were lucky enough to find an apartment uh, just a block away. And it has very many advantages for us because you never, you never ever consider how your bodily uh, strength leaves you slowly, very slowly. And to consider that in advance 
to have no steps, to have an elevator, um, things like that. Uh, when I was 60, I didn't even think about it, but my husband thought I had, luckily, and so we found this apartment and we have a rather large balcony and I have too many plants out there because they need so much, much water right now in this summer. Anyway, um, so having grandchildren nearby is something you can take care of. And I guess I have been a caretaker also all my life and I wouldn't want to miss it. But of course I reduced it because my strength isn't as much as it used to be. Doreen? Yes, and you make a, a wonderful point that there is tremendous joy and satisfaction in taking care of someone, especially someone you love. Um, at the same time, um, I think the feeling is not so much that I feel responsible for them. I think it's more like <clears throat> one of those situations where your gift is also a double-edged sword. So when I'm with people, I absorb them. Mm. <laughs> you know, all the nonverbal cues, all the, and of course, this was my profession for decades. So, you know, I hear what they're not saying. <laughs> I sense what they can't afford to feel or they would fall apart. And I saw this in a recent visit with my sister and her husband who have the daughter with cancer. And they each have their ways of managing this horrific, horrible disease in someone so young. I could feel the grief, but they have their ways of managing and I don't want to touch that. So I carry it around with me. I feel the grief that they're trying to keep at a distance. And I don't blame them for it at all. Um, and it's not that I don't want to do that for them and with them, I do. But it does wear me out, you know, especially if I'm staying with them. And what I've been doing in recent years is I'll, I'll go for a month visit twice a year. Or I'll maybe this last time I was there for two months. And by the end of it, I am really depleted in terms of myself. And then I've got my own little life here to figure out, but I'm carrying, I'm still carrying their grief. Now I have a friend who says I've got poor boundaries. I don't think that's it uh, because I can, I can compartmentalize and I can shut doors, but not when I'm in the midst of the situation. <laughs> so, um, so it's tricky, but I, I do hear what you're saying. And yes, there's tremendous joy in taking care of people you love and, and that, and perhaps it's because my family has this extra burden right now that I just need a little time and space. Uh, and, and because I do this all the time, Christine knows we went out to dinner Saturday night. And there was a man there who we all know and have known for years and years and years. And I was, and I'm, I couldn't help but picking up a lot of the tension he was feeling. And it was like, I don't, I don't want to feel that. Um, but when the situation isn't right for them expressing what they are feeling, you know, and sort of owning it in the situation, then I'm walking away with traces of it. So, you know, um, this is more, maybe you've given me a chance to go into it a little bit further. And this is more what I'm trying to, you know, separate uh, from others, at which I hope will prepare me to be better in the midst of relationship you know, where I can care for and be with, but not have to, as you said before, not, not have to either feel responsible for it or keep feeling their feelings, so to speak. So I don't know if that makes any sense to any of you, but it's my peculiarity. 
I think it makes a lot of sense. And as Monia said, we all are sort of carers, you know, in some way or other. So it's an interesting topic. How is it for you, Christine? Especially maybe this situation which Lorraine is talking about was, yeah. is it the same for you? Do you feel this or have you a, a way to, to shield you from these things? <laughs> no shielding. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, I mean, I certainly wonder after I'm no longer seeing clients and have that, you know, professional role what will that be like? Um, so yeah, I it it feels daunting to think about that. Um, but I'm pretty set on letting it happen. And I won't the thing is you don't know, I guess, until you get walk through the door and you're on the other side. I mean, I can think about it and prepare for it, but the experience is gonna be different once you, you know, go through that portal. Um, I kind of see it also, I, the, it, it's tied in with the overall theme of aging. And I feel like, you know, aging is in some way pruning, you know, whether it's downsizing your home or going out less and spending more time, you know, in your, in your home and, and being comfortable there and friends that you may have had that, you know, it's hard to get together or see them. It's kind of like this pruning of life where I, I don't want my world to become too small, but at the same time, you can't necessarily juggle all the things you used to juggle. As Monia said, for one thing, you just don't have the capacity. You, you generally, things are more tiring. Um, so juggling what I used to juggle is not going to be a thing. And I just want to be conscious of, you know, as I prune my life in various ways, um, just deciding what are my priorities, who, you know, my friends that mean the most to me, and maybe letting go of friends that are harder to maintain or whatever. Um, I feel like with popular culture, there's a definite pruning. There's young people who are becoming famous for various cultural you know, movies, song, dance, all kinds of arts and, and stuff like that, politics, whatever. And I just don't have the bandwidth to really care about that. <laughs> and in some way, I realize I'm choosing not to be um, participating in a in a much bigger world, but I'm I'm coming to terms with that, um, that it's okay to choose. Uh, not to hold that like I used to when I was younger. So I don't know, the word pruning kind of comes to mind and making things more manageable. And, and so you can enjoy the things that you've chosen. So you can enjoy your priorities. You can't hold it all. Uh, so that's my two cents. Yeah, thank you. I wrote it down and I think I will put it as a title for our meeting today, pruning of life. <laughs> getting older yeah that's nice what is your take on that i don't even know what that word means i cannot understand your explanation but i pruning uh beschneiden also uh, bäume beschneiden prune the olive trees for instance you know cut away the in in the the things which are not useful you know in the wave as for olive trees is that then the the fruit can come better you know so it's a good it's a good um how do you say uh pa paraphrase uh good what is the word yeah good, sure. uh, metaphor metaphor metaphor, metaphor. metaphor. Yeah. yeah so yeah. i learned a new word thank you <laughs> I was going to ask you both, also Haneli, and uh, of your take on that. Maybe Haneli first. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been witness to that now of my two friends who I currently stay in Cape Town. They both retired last year. And so I'll give it another spin because I've, like I said, I'm the witness of what's happening to them. Their worlds have shrink, shrank, shrink so much since they've retired. It's scary. And I can see the effect on their bodies. It's like they're aging, like 
like they age 10 years in literally in a year. And it's not because of health issues. They're completely healthy. And just watching from the outside, seeing this, for me, it's quite scary to see that happening to people that you care for and that you know so well. And I think, Monia, you, you said something that they don't do, which I try to inspire them to do and to encourage them to do, is to get other hobbies or, or, or um, stay involved in something, doesn't matter what it is, Keep your mind busy and and, and um, yeah um, stimulate your mind constantly in some ways, not completely distract you know distracting yourself from the world, because it's it's really scary how small that their world became. But because the effect of that is also how they now look at life that's around us in the world. It's like very intellectual, very intelligent people suddenly have these very small worldviews which doesn't make sense at all. And they were not ready for this, do I think, but they're still young. The one is 55 and the other one is 61. And for me, that's quite scary at that age to just give up on life like that. My one friend, I see him going into depression because he lays in bed till 12 in the morning and I have to go and say, hey, get up, go do something, go to the movies, go sit at the ocean, do stuff like that. So that's the other spin on it of people getting into that such a state and then aging very quickly as well when the body starts giving up to you because there's no real exercise anymore and the likes. And dancing is really, they both are dancers, uh, ballroom dancers and Latin dancers. And they even gave that up. So it's the mental, the mindset that really creates for me that kind of, I don't want that. I definitely don't want that in my life. But I want to share with you ladies, if I can, Something from a book that I found fascinating. I found this book many, many years ago, almost two decades ago, from Zuzana Buda Budapest. And the title of the book is Summoning the Fates, A Generational Woman's Guide to Destiny and Sacred Transformation. Now, Christine, when you spoke about pruning, and also you, Lorraine, sharing your experience so respectfully and so vulnerably, I just want to read something for you from this. She says, she goes through the different age groups and then she says what's happening, which she calls your mission curve, is when Uranus really comes into play from an astrological perspective in your life. And then from the age of 63 to 84, we remove ourselves from the battlefield or we enter the battlefield if we haven't done it yet. So Lorraine, what you're speaking from me is you're removing yourself from the battlefield, literally. <laughs> All things must pass. And then she gives examples of what's happening in nature with panthers and tigers. And she says, our society will see more and more older people taking to the street to defend, for example, some causes like nature, wildlife, animal rights and the likes. And then she gave Jimmy Carter as an example who built houses for the poor in his 70s. At that time when this book was published, he was in his 70s and recites poetry. And then she also, in the other part of it, she talks about skills dance. It's, it's really this age between 60 and 85, where she says it's your third destiny. Your third? third your, what? Third, your third destiny, number three. Yeah. Her third destiny. And she says it's about simplicity and expressing yourself in new ways. And then she goes through the different years. And for example, she's, I'll just give a few examples. She says, from the year 60 to 62, this is the time to review your leftover rebellions and give some of them inner action, for example. Then 63, she says, your new self identity is emerging. Your priorities are different now. And if you're giving your energy to others all your life, you are now taking the energy for yourself. Mm -hmm. You were taking in energy from others all your life. Now you will give it back. This, for example, I'll just read 72 to 73. For Girl. example, and, and later on, 
my my internet connection is a bit slow. And then later on, she says, she says between 85 and 86, for example, you really begin to look at immortality and you begin to have an experience of life in a different way of intimacy. Just a few examples. But I, I just found that removing yourself from a battlefield and not taking care of yourself, exactly what you just said in the beginning, Lorraine. So thank you, Uncle. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Yes, I, if I may say, I really resonated with those two things. Removing yourself from the battlefield, and I feel it viscerally because I'm not driven by adrenaline as much anymore. And I look, I was just thinking this this week. In fact, I'm looking back over my life, my adult life, and a lot of it was driven by adrenaline. Whether it's facing my fears or, uh, you know, a lot of excitement or whatever. And now as I'm letting go, of course, I have more word finding problems, which drives me nuts. It's almost like adrenaline was helping my memory as well. But I'm also, I'm misreading things now. It's like I'm merging words and it's almost like my brain is becoming unmoored from, from the battlefield rules. You know, and it's uh, that was fascinating. And the other thing that I really loved about what you read was um, if you've if you've lived your life putting out energy for others, now you want to take it back for yourself. And I think that's exactly what I would like to experience before I put it out again. I mean, it's not that I want yeah. to become a hermit, not by any means, but I, I just want to know what that sensation is like, you know. So thank you very much. That was that was fun. And I'm thinking of um, our age range. <laughs> so um, I have so many different examples. Like my grandmother, she decided now she's an old woman. She sat in her uh, armchair, knitted a bit, uh, beating the cat if it dared to come in. And she didn't do anything. Not with the with the grandkids, so we were living next door. In she had a flat next to us, but she gained. She, when I remember her, she was like hundred and twenty kilos or more, and that's it. So, and then she became. Um, there she uh, got dementia for eight years and. That was it. And my father, her son, um, he was uh, just he learned English and French uh, after after he retired. He was doing the the accounting for the old people that were his age, <laughs> and uh, they were traveling around like like. Uh, looking at all the churches in Strasbourg in I don't know where, uh, going with a plan wagon through it, uh, Ireland and things like that. And he was like half a year, he was sick. I mean, he, he got uh, Parkinson's, but so he, for the last half year, he was um, like sick and couldn't, couldn't talk and everything was... And he was four days in bed before he died with 92. So it's, uh, and then I was at a birthday uh, two years ago, I think a friend who is three years older than me. And they were, how long do you still have to work? What is your health doing? Um, and, and then maybe about the last vacation or something, but they really like, I have to get out of here. It's it was it was spooky. So um, yeah, and and sometimes I mean money wise, I think it's it's not so easy to to be freelancer. But sometimes I really love it because uh, I can work as much as I want and as little as I want if I can afford it. But but this is like I can. 
learn. So I think I will learn with 90 still. So it's it doesn't feel... I mean, you know me now a little bit, <laughs> how much I have learned in between. So, yeah, new certifications or something. Yeah, so, so this is... Um, I think this is so individual how how people react to this. And the the father of a um, school friend, he retired. And about six months later, he died. He couldn't cope with it. So what I'm hearing is, what is needed is eternal curiosity to keep yourself alive. You know, if you give up and say, uh, everything is like this, blah, then you're gone, you know. But as soon as you have something which is maybe not exciting, but at least interesting, then you go for it and you find it important enough to, to live for it. I mean, I always think that... Uh, being having become so old makes sense and gives you also a certain responsibility. I mean, wh why are you, you, we are so old? I think we have a task <laughs> in older age and uh, we need to fulfill that. And we don't fulfill it sitting in the chair like this and no? so <laughs> curious oh, oh, about. Oh, a word that we've not really uttered is vulnerability. <laughs> so I think that's uh, to go back to, you know, what we may fear about getting older and letting go and retiring is the sense of vulnerability. Uh, Tom and I went to a friend's 70th birthday party yesterday. And it was both wonderful to be able to say, hey, you know, we've made it <laughs> um, when other people haven't, but um, also sad. I think we all experience that because we have gotten old together and we remember, you know, 40 years back. Uh, we all remember 40 years back pretty easily. Um, so it, it's daunting because we recognize the vulnerability. And Tom said he felt quite depressed after the party and had trouble sleeping because he looked around this person's property and saw things that were in disarray, things that were broken and taken apart and obviously not put back together, just signs of entropy <laughs> and yeah. atrophy. Um, and it made Tom feel really vulnerable because he was like, you know, is that going to be me someday? You know, I can't do the things, the projects, can't keep up with stuff, you know, um, can't keep up with the property and, and whatnot. Um, and it made him feel vulnerable. Um, and I think that was what was the scary part, uh, recognizing that we're all going to have to, I'm going to have to face that. I feel vulnerable at times, not too much, not too often. And I manage to often chase that away, but I'm I'm aware of that. It it ties in with mortality quite well. Um yeah. But yeah, I'm aware of that. Yeah. My father even said, um, and we haven't talked about that. My father said, I feel like a Geiger counter. That that uh, when I come in closer it's uh, so like people dying around you, like a lot more than in earlier times. In earlier times, it's more like a an accident or cancer or something like that. So, but um, so it's bad enough. But here, it's like part of that that stage in which we are. And uh, yeah, people around us, people we know, people we love, maybe even our closest ones. So, and, and he said, um, 
at a certain point, I don't know how old he was, maybe 60, uh, 86 or so. Then he said, um, we, we are grateful for every moment uh, God gives us together. And we are ready when the call comes. So they were more and more. My mother got dementia then, but uh, but he was more and more like not eager to go, but ready to go when when it's time. You know, I found that one of the lessons of aging for me has been to learn to tolerate grief. Yeah. Aging is like a series of losses, but only in terms of how you saw the world before. The one gift of aging that I absolutely love, and, and people have talked about this for millennia, I am the best person I've ever been. <laughs> and a lot of that has to do with my losses most recently a divorce about four years ago and it continues to astonish me and maybe that's how I got into psychology in the first place that we can take some profound loss and make something more of ourselves through it if we're lucky and if we have the right support in place because support is everything. I, I don't think any of us can do life alone. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of a weird <laughs> positive side of, of grief and vulnerability and letting go. It's, you know, there are fewer goblins inside to run away from because we've just sat there with death staring us in the face. You know, and I've been fortunate in not having had a serious illness, at least up to now. And that's another profound kind of lesson. But um, yeah, but just sort of accepting, okay, that grief is going to be part of life uh, and not running away from it. S for me was another step because I had a lot of loss and a lot of grief in the last few years um, and there's more to come <laughs> so um, anyway yeah that was thank you yeah at the end he said I have more people on the other side than here <laughs> As she was speaking, Lorraine and you, Gertrude, I was just sorry, Monica. I was just reminded of some research that I've done that demonstrates that and most of this was done in the US. Demonstrates that I can't remember the exact age groups, but it was we are our most creative and productive between the ages sixty to eighty. Wow! And I found that fascinating. Uh, between 70 and 80, even more so. And Monia, you for me are a perfect example of this. You're a living example <laughs> of it. We become so creative after 60. I mean, I take myself too. It's it just it's like it's increasing all the time. It's not there's no stop to it. And it's really energizing. So and then for me it flips back the health, you know, the, the part that we succumb to health issues because we are so we're always in ourselves are co-creating every seven years. So it's a continuous process, even in your minds, everywhere. So, and Armonia, you're the perfect living example of that. Uh, Lorraine, I was wondering about the shamanic qualities of your psyche, that you really, as you said, you absorb their, so this is, to me, this is some kind of shamanic quality and to let go of that is very difficult, I guess. You will probably always get into other people's minds and, and psyches. And just maybe you just have to be aware that it's no longer your 
responsibility. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Sorry, I thought I had. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. It's always going to be with me. And while intellectually I let go of that, okay, I have to do, I, I perceive this, now I have to do something about it. Intellectually, I've let that go. But like with my sister's family, um, it's not so easy to let go of. So for me, leaving there and coming to the other coast, there on the East Coast, um, is helpful to me. Um, but also, I, I think I've, I've had to learn. I saw a wonderful, weird film decades ago called Resurrection about a woman who had a gift for healing others and how over time it sort of exploded in her face and people became mistrustful of her and started attacking her and it was just a mess and she withdrew completely and um left whatever town she was in and uh worked a gas station in the middle of a desert somewhere so there were never any any other people around her and she totally escaped it um and then these people, this young family stopped by for gas one day and they had a little girl and the little girl happened to have cancer. And the woman said nothing, uh, but she interacted with the family and she talked with the little girl and showed her around some of her collection of various collections of things. And then at the end of the film, this still brings tears to my eyes, she wrapped her hands around the little girl and you knew that that little girl would be healed, but she said nothing about it. She did nothing about it. And, you know, so that gift was still there, but, you know, she had to get completely away somehow. It just moved me a lot because it's crazy what can happen sometimes in this world. And sometimes you just need to withdraw and just not say anything about what you do or what you think or what you feel. Just if there's a way to interact, fine, do it. And if there isn't, just walk away with a little bit more of that grief. So, you know, I mean, as you can see, my feelings can be very close to the surface sometimes. <laughs> so, Don't you just talk about like, like letting go more and more of ego? and how you want to be in the world and how the world should perceive you and things like that. Isn't that um, just, just more being your essence and that's it if you are in a gas station or wherever you, you trust? Yes, yeah. yeah, that is an image of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You're just being who you are and not trying to make a big deal of it or have a career based around it or make money off of it or anything like that. Yeah, that's a really good image for them. I like that phrase, being your essence. Just being. And yeah, and you can see the difference if people don't do that. I mean, we have pretty good examples in the... <laughs> in, in politics <laughs> <laughs> getting old doesn't mean that you are capable of doing that yeah i think this is the meaning uh, coming back to the meaning of life and the possibility we have when we are getting older that we come nearer to this possibility not everybody does i think i have often said richard Rohr falling upward where he says uh up a certain age, uh, your task is not to be in the world anymore uh, as you were before. And you you get adult in the sense that you, how can you say, not search for the meaning of life, but the, the meaning of life comes to you in some way. And then uh, some people never do. 
Some mm -hmm. people never get adult, also they are 80 or 90 or something, you know, and some people even before uh, 40, 45, I think he, he says is the earliest moment when you enter in this uh, second second half of, of life in his mind, in his um, ideas. Um, but it's normal that we, the more we age, we find other priorities, which was said before also, and that these other priorities have to do with this accepting vulnerability, accepting the connection with something bigger than ourselves, and uh, even letting go of the outside world in a certain sense, uh, be, observe it more than being <laughs> involved completely, no? In, in some sense. So that's my five cents to this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I put the book in the chat, his book. Um, yeah, and he very much speaks, uh, Gertrude, about the ego and striving in that first half of life. And then the second half is really about being, just coming to terms with being. Yeah. If you let it. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you can let go of the self-importance. Yeah, but it depends either on your willingness or I would also say on the age of your soul. I, I believe in soul ages and if you are a very young soul, you probably have difficulty to, when you are old soul, that's uh, almost inevitable <laughs> that you enter in this stage of, of life. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Some people can, some people can't. Let's say this way. So, I just want to to share an observa uh, observation. When my mother died, she was the last in the generation. So, all the others have gone, and it was like a shift in the universe. It was like all of a sudden we children became the old ones the 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 last generation and my kids were like coming here and their kids were the the young generation so and my elder sister who is who was the oldest now in this in this um she was like i couldn't believe it because within days or so and and at the funeral afterwards she was the elder she was the one who really took over like the 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 baton or whatever you call it this and i could really feel her to be the elder and before she was just my sister and and that there was such a phenomenon um I, I could hardly understand. And then I said, yeah, it, it was a visceral shift in the universe. This is now the older generation and now the these the our kids take over and are the ones. And and for us to yeah, more like to support, to to be in the background, not to create. I mean, being creative is different, but not to, I have to do a business and now I'm doing this and that. And I can, my last training, the, the WeFlow training, I, I was the older or I'm still the oldest and I am very, very close to the youngest who is 23 now. And, and this is so wonderful to see them thrive so i don't have my own agenda in it yeah yeah wonderful so maybe for the end for closing one word or one sentence for all of us how you get go out of this meeting what did it impact you or what did you learn or what did you want to follow up who 
who wants to start starts i will start i just feel my heart is opening up <laughs> thank you i'm complete i was wondering about grief and the necessity for grief in our lives and how to yeah how to I, I don't want to say manage it but how to be aware of it and because so many of our friends have died already and in my dreams about half of the people, they are dead, but I don't notice it in my dreams. Then uh, they are still very much alive. And, and uh, it's only one person who said, but you are dead already. Never mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. That's all I am thinking of. Yeah. Thank you. I'm really happy to see you, Monia again because i haven't seen you in such a long while and to see everybody and to meet you lauren um yeah so happy that i made it today even a little late but for me it's i love that conversation because i mean we all have to face it <laughs> we cannot escape it and and so not to pretend to be young and not to, yeah, to indulge in self-importance or whatever. So like really liked how, how can we age in a way that, that is, um, what's, what's the word? It's not only conscious, but also um, ehrenhaft or uh, in a with würde. Yeah, we yeah. Have the topic of, of, of würde, yeah. With dignity in a, yeah. No matter how the, the mm -hmm. physical body or whatever is doing and vice versa how how our mental state can help you help help us to to create it not to suffer it i find it curious that obviously these things are in the field yesterday in the german speaking salon i led yesterday night we talked about dignity and we talked about dignity of life and dignity of dying. And, and so <laughs> it seems to be in the field and seems to want to be worked on. So I'm grateful that you were here. And I give over to Christine. I think you were missing. Yeah, so I'm going to be thinking about that pruning process and knowing it involves loss and grief as you clip away and creates vulnerability, but makes room for fruit and other joys. And I feel like this group is like fertilizer <laughs> for that. It, it uh, is enriching uh, the soil of our lives. And I'm complete. Thank you. And last word to you, Lorraine, you started. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really, really appreciate um all of your participation in talking about this and, and actually helping me bring out more of uh, what's been happening for me on this. Um, and I look forward to reading these books that have been suggested. I mean, clearly I need to bring more attention to that emotional side of what's happening, not just selling a house and buying a house and, and all of that stuff. So thank you very much. It was really a pleasure being with you. Thank you all, and we meet again in two weeks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Have a good day. Have a good evening. <laughs>